you know, it's hard. It's hard to, uh, to not look forward to seeing you all. Uh, Bonnie and I, for decades, uh, were in local church ministry. My favorite time was getting up Sunday morning, uh, you know, 5 a.m., and, and getting over to the church about an hour and a half before it, the doors opened, and then watching the first ones come, and we would walk all around the building and meet everybody possible. And uh, you don't know how hard it is now that we live on the road and have an almost completely different, wonderful group of people every week or every two weeks. There's something about the body of Christ you live with and, and go through life with the same ones for a long period of time. And so, uh, in, a, in a sense, you become our, our little uh, local church that we connect to, even if it's only for a week. But it is the last time, and I'm going to talk extra fast because this is my favorite message. Uh, when you think of the scriptures, you think of all the, the incredible things we've been talking about and Jesus' expectations, but to come to this passage in Revelation 3, and you can start turning there, third chapter of Revelation, the Church of Philadelphia, we come to the truth that we can meet Christ absolute approval. Now let me put it this way. The normal Christian life Jesus designed not the extraordinary Apostle Paul, not the giant of the faith Abraham, the normal first century Christian life presented in the scriptures is a life where you go through knowing and feeling and experiencing and, and just basking in Christ's absolute approval. That, that he's looking down just saying, yes, yes, that's your, yes, that's what I want. That's what I said, and you're experiencing it. So don't think that's kind of like someday or ultimate or finally, you know, when you, you, know, you know, are in a cell somewhere near execution for, you know, as a martyr of Christ. It's supposed to be how we go through life every day. And by the way, when you live this way, knowing his absolute approval, the world cannot resist asking questions. Because when we're functioning the way Christ designed, we have what he said in, in John chapter 7, out of us flow rivers of life-giving water. That's why we're, we're, we're knowing his approval, we're experiencing the power of his spirit. It's just unbelievable that it flows into every part of life. Well, there aren't many truths that can change your life forever. But Jesus' simple introduction to the church at Philadelphia gives us four truths. The four, by the way, Jesus Christ commends four truths to them. He says, this is what I'm seeing in your life. And from that, we can extract what it was that, that kind of is the circumference. It, what, what are the dimensions of? How do we know that we're doing, that we're living, we're being what he expects there are four truths that Philadelphia built their church and their lives on. And once they understood this, they were never the same. Real quickly, number one, if you've never adopted a missionary that you pray for, Bonnie and I would love to volunteer. That's our prayer card. That's my email address. It's just my, you know, pastorjohnbarnett at gmail.com. Boy, that's the simplest email address in the world. And I would love to send you one. And, and send you one, and, and you'd know uh, we have this little brochure where we go, and you could pray for us. Because prayer allows you to be catapulted to the front lines. As you pray for those, the Lord says you're partaking in all that they do. Number two, these are the courses that we teach, and they're back there shrink-wrapped. Uh, this is the, the grow one, that top one. Uh, knowing God is an overview from Genesis to Revelation of the theme of every book and how they relate to one another. Right below it is the archaeological verifications, the seven reasons why we know the scripture is true. That is the one thing I teach in every one of these classrooms around the world because young people are being taught that you can't trust God or the Bible. Uh, that top one, what's next? Jesus gave a, his longest message on prophecy in Matthew 24. And by the way, those things Jesus said you would see, we are seeing today. And, and I call it the, uh, the seven signs uh, that Jesus gave of what the world's like at the second coming. Not at the rapture, the second coming. The middle one, the, the power of word-filled prayers. Wow, 
Jesus says that we are supposed to pray in a certain way, and Paul said pray without ceasing. And there are many things God has ordained that will not happen apart from prayer. Uh, the top right, fullness of the Holy Spirit, that's supposed to be the norm. Yesterday I talked about bitterness. That's how we grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. So that whole uh, spirit-filled life of new beginnings. And the more we understand it, the more we share it. And then the bottom right, the one, that one that says the Master's message of eternal life, that was, that was one of the most fascinating studies of my life. I looked at everything Jesus did in the four Gospels when he would introduce the Gospel to someone and share the plan of salvation. Then I went through the book of Acts and saw the 30-plus different times the Gospel was publicly shared. And you know what I found? Here's the simple thing. You don't even need that, except it's fascinating to, to learn and study. No one ever shared the Gospel quite the same way. Not even Jesus. I mean, he just... It always was the same message, but it never came out the same way. It just was like this, and I call it the Master's Message of Eternal Life, and that's that uh, first pack that we have back there about uh, starting. And then the growing pack is spiritual warfare. I mean, I talked about that the very first day, going, don't go out on patrol in Taliban territory without suiting up. Uh, what the, the whole idea of waiting for Jesus, uh, Paul's first epistle to those people in Thessalonica is an unbelievable message about how, how it looks to wait for Jesus every day. Every chapter of 1 Thessalonians is about Christ coming. Then the middle, this is what we teach in those refugee uh, uh, camp uh, ministries that are, are leading people to Christ, that are coming and streaming into Europe from the Middle East, and they have no concept of the Christian family. And so they ask us for, for people that have no concept of the Christian family, would you teach them? And I say, hey, there's only one curriculum in the whole Bible, it's Titus 2, that in one passage says the older men, the older women, the younger women, and the younger men are supposed to live. And there are 24 qualities, 12 for men and 12 for women, uh, for older and younger men and women. And there's only one passage in the Bible where every group in the church is addressed in one sequential curriculum form, and it's Titus 2. And, and Bonnie and I were just in, a, in this refugee uh, training center where believers from 19 different countries, all who floated over to Europe from somewhere on a raft, or trek through the, the desert, were sitting there, and, and they had the most mixed up, sin-scarred, messed up, backward and upside down lives, came to Christ, and they were saying, this is what we want. And we call it Grace Energized Women, the 12 aspects of a woman whose life is lived in the way that is eternally God's way and Grace Energized Men in the top right, is Christ in all the scriptures, it's just what the tabernacle is about, what all those amazing, I mean, I could tell you stories in Leviticus, they'll make Leviticus one of your favorite books. I mean, just the cleansing, the leper one is take a clay pot, put two pigeons in, put a lid on, reach in, wring the neck of one, get the blood all over, and let the other one out. Boy, what a gross thing that was. You know what it was? A picture of Christ's incarnation going in the clay pot, of his substitutionary death, the blood, and then they would open the lid and the, the one bird was scared to death because the other one had just been murdered and it got its blood all over it and it would fly out of there like mad and that's a picture of the resurrection. And that little procedure was done over and over in the wilderness as a picture of Christ coming to earth, taking on human form, substitutionarily shedding his blood and rising from the dead. And so Christ is in all the scripture and it's just amazing. One of the greatest pictures is the ark of Noah and there's only one door and God shut it and you can't ever get out of it until he opens the door. In other words, eternal security. It's great. And then the bottom right one there is the pathway of the most high. That's the tabernacle, which by the way shows up in Revelation, yeah, the elements of it in the temple, the heavenly temple, and it's unbelievable. And also this uh, YouTube channel, we, uh, there's, there's one thing I wish that you would think about praying for. We have right now a campaign going on in Italy, Brazil, Argentina, um, uh, the Philippines, and I forget one other place, where we're offering to those people a course on what is the Roman Catholic Church. And it's actually the church history course that, that I taught at the Master's Seminary as well as here at, at Word of Life. And we're offering that through this agency that will drop into people's feeds 
this, this course, and it's a picture of the Pope, you know, his back looking out from the Vatican, and right over him it says, what is the Roman Catholic Church? Wouldn't you like to understand church history and the Bible and all that? Did you know that we've had 80,000 people take that course so far in Italy, Argentina, Brazil, uh, the Philippines, and Mexico, and I can't, and it's just amazing that this tool, this purveyor, you know, YouTube is a purveyor of a lot of filth, if you ask me. But that same pipeline takes the gospel. And, and, it, and it's dropped into the feeds of these people's Facebook accounts. And you know how if you're just messing around on your phone and something pops in that's interesting to you, you just hit it. And it takes them right to that channel. And they... Uh, become a part of that course. Okay, let's go back to Revelation. How do you live for God in a dangerous world? That's what the whole book is about. And by the way, the, the tribulation shows us that all events in the world are under God's control. And so that's why the, the people love this book, as I told you early on. It's a, a literal group of people that live in this geographic area 2,000 years ago. But as we see in every letter, as we will see in the letter to the church in Philadelphia, starting in verse 7 of chapter 3, of Revelation, we'll see the truths that God gave them. So let's, let's read those. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, and you can just see what I'm reading from my Bible. But, uh, and to the angel, remember, that's the messenger. That was the, the representative of God in that local church, and there was a plurality of them, but one of them got this scroll, and as the elder, as the teacher, as the shepherd, as the pastor of this local church, he read this letter in Philadelphia, and Jesus says, right, these things says he who is holy. Wow. That's the first thing Jesus points out that these people had acknowledged, the holiness of God. He who is true. Jesus is truth. He's the source of truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He who has the key of David. Now, how many times have you read that in your life? Because most people have read all this. And not stop to think, why does it say that? What is the key of David? In fact, if we did a quiz, like a million-dollar giveaway, I bet most people wouldn't even be able to win the prize. They don't even know. They'd never stop. Did you know Americans are comfortable, well-adjusted readers? We just want to make it through. The idea of reading is finishing it. Progress, you know? We just, that's, everything is progress in America, whether you understand it or not, whether you, whether you really comprehend it or not, you just get through it. And so we're just so comfortable reading a lot of stuff, we have no idea what it means. And we don't want to be distracted. We just want to get through it. The key of David is one of the most massive truths of Christ. And it comes from Isaiah 22, 22, actually, literally. And, and it tells us about, and we'll look at this morning, this offer he makes to us. He who opens and no one shuts. Who shuts and no one opens. Well, that's code. What is this open and no one can shut and shut and no one can open? Well, Jesus, in his ministry in the Gospels, reduced it down to one word. Now, there's a study that if you want to do something that's very fascinating, look at every time Jesus says the word never. I will never leave you or forsake you. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never, what, die. If you eat of the, the bread, uh, you know, he says, my body is bread, you will never perish. If you drink of this water, you will never thirst. Jesus does not exaggerate. I do. You know, my wife's quite a fisherman. She catches these pike. Uh, she got a 34-incher, and it was so big that we put the big marine oil, or I mean the gas can. You know how heavy those marine gas cans are when you carry them out the boat? That fish was flopping around, so I put the, the, the marine, you know, the five-gallon can of gas on top of it to hold it down. It was bucking the gas can. That's how big it was. But when I tell the story, it just keep, you know, the 34-inch fish is, what, 60 <laughs> inches long. So we are prone to what? Everything gets a little better, an exaggeration. Jesus doesn't do that. But when he says never, he means never. He who has the key to David opens things, and they can never get shut. And he closes things, even in our lives, and they never get opened back up. I know your works. Oh, See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. I know your works, period. Now, I just want to pause. 
Do you know what an amazing thing that is? This church was amazing. They weren't given anything extra. Jesus says, I know your works. Think about the context. They had the same epistles. They had the same gospels. They had the same word of God that every other church had. They had the same temptations, the same struggles, the same pressures. But Jesus said, I know your works. And I know that you're doing just what I expect you to do. See, he had walked around. He knew their motivations. He knew their thoughts. He knew their, their innermost workings. He saw them as they went through life. He saw them as they gathered. And look what he says about them. Verse 8, you have a little strength. Did you know this was not the mega church? This is not Ephesus. Ephesus had a lot of strength. Ephesus had the biggest bench in the history of the church. I mean, they had multiple apostles. They had multiple mega superstar Christians. They had the biggest everything. This church didn't. They were just little. But you've kept my word. Wait a minute. John 14, 21 says, He that has my word and keeps it is the one that loves me. Jesus says, "You, you have my word and you've kept it. You haven't denied my name. Indeed, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. He was promising them an a incredible, incredible revival going on. He said there are some of those recalcitrant, hard-hearted uh, Jewish people that were resisting everything of the gospel in the first century. Remember, they were dogging Paul, and they were, uh, of course, they crucified Christ. They were just against everything. And he says, I'm going to make those people come, and they're going to worship. <laughs> and, and they're going to they're be people that are going to magnificently come to Christ. You know, every time I lead someone to the Lord, especially someone that I would think has no interest in the gospel, it's kind of like a replaying of this, that to see those people that you think would most unlikely ever respond to Christ when they do, like this group in Philadelphia, you go, wow, God is great, God is good. But you will know that I have loved you because you have kept my command. See, he comes right back. The only thing, if you want to distill down Philadelphia to one word, they were faithful. They weren't mega superstars, they weren't ascetics, I mean, they weren't the people that were the walking Bibles like Jack Van Empe used to be. They are not, you know, the Billy Graham leading millions of people to the Lord, they were just faithful. See, normal Christians get Christ's absolute approval if you faithfully confess your sins, if you're faithfully allowing Jesus to cleanse us of our sins, if you're faithfully saying, Lord, I'm going to sit before your word as a mirror and I'm going to look at myself in it, and I'm going to see everywhere I don't conform to the image of Christ, and I'm going to ask you to change me. I mean, last night, uh, our campfire at the lodge was comfortably air-conditioned, indoors, soft chairs. I... Do you still do the campfire out by the pond? Oh, you did it in here. I remember the ones out by the pond, the bugs, and it was, I mean, uh, it, it was really something when we used to go way out there. So you guys were comfortable, warm, air-conditioned. It's cold in here. Turn the air conditioning down. Uh, I mean up or something. But, uh, but, uh, but last night, seeing all those tied ribbons, and you know, you know Bonnie and I, we always... We always go up and we tie one to renew and say, Lord, all we have belongs to you. And, and you bought us and we want to live for you. And we want to stick close to the cross. That They were normal believers. They were renewing their consecration. They kept his command. They persevered. And Jesus said, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. By the way, most theologians believe that's a, a very, very pointed promise of Christ to be kept from the hour that will test the whole world. There's only one hour that's going to test the whole world. That is called the great tribulation when the wrath of God comes. So this is kind of like a promise to them that they're going to be kept from that hour. You say, but well, were they? That was 2,000 years ago. Well, you see... Remember, this is to all the churches, and if you look at the seven churches in order, Ephesus portrays 
the first century kind of early church, and Smyrna, the suffering church, the second and third century church, and then by the time you get to Pergamos, it's when the Roman Catholic Church, kind of the, the, the merging of paganism with the church, but that happened in the fourth century, and then you get to Thyatira, that's through the Dark Ages, and then you get to Sardis, that's in the Renaissance times when the church was, as you know, making Martin Luther sick, and then you get to this, this whole church of the Reformation, which is the, the, the idea that, that Sardis woke up, that the dead church came to life. And then you get to the missionary church that followed right after the Reformation when the gospel went again to the whole world. And that's the Philadelphia age. And then you have the Laodicean church, which is kind of what we're living in. And so what he's saying is there is an hour coming that's going to test the whole world, and when that hour comes, I'm going to save you from that hour. And I'm not going to cover the rapture today because it's been covered well in other places, but this church, Jesus, you notice, doesn't condemn. Do you notice there's no nevertheless, but? He does not correct them. He does not rebuke them. He didn't point out anything they're doing wrong. There isn't any of those, I have this against you. There's only approval. And this is what he continues to say in verse 11. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. You know what he says? No coasting. No coasting. You know what I see in America? A lot of people coasting. When they get to the age when they ought to be the most most influential people in the church, they take all their winnings and they move to play golf in either Arizona or Florida. Now, if you move to Florida to go to the Word of Life, you know, uh, senior, uh, the, the trailer park down there, and help the students and help in every way. I was just down there in March. They raised 150000 from all of the retirees as scholarships for 1,800 campers to come. Wow. I mean, those are not your typical check out a church and go play golf people. But you know what the Lord says? Don't, don't let anyone take your crown. Do you know what Paul said? I don't want to be disqualified. You ever read that? 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Paul, disqualified? What does that mean? Well, the Greek word adokimos means that, that he would be ejected from the running of getting a crown. And, and how did you do it in the first century? Well, they used to have all these foot races and you had lanes. The Olympics, you know, were back then. They were called the Pan-Corinthian and Pan-Isthmian and Pan-Ionian games that fed into the Olympic. But one of the big things was the foot race. In the foot race, you could be the fastest, but if you stepped on the line that separated the lanes, they had all these Hawkeye judges. And when we take groups over, we go to these stadiums, and you actually could see the judge stand, and they were right there. They had them where they could always be watching. And if you stepped on, which is, you're supposed to stay inside. If you stepped on the line, you're out. You know what Paul said? I don't want to get disqualified. I don't want to lose my crown. Remember, there are five crowns. One of them is whether or not you discipline your body, whether or not you bring your flesh under the Spirit's control. You know what most people? The Spirit is quenched and grieved by the flesh. No, no. Bring the flesh under the Spirit's control. Let no one take your crown. He who overcomes, by the way, what is overcome? Is that super Christians? Kind of a higher level? Kind of the diamond Christian, you know, is the. No, no. All, 1 John says, all Christians are overcomers. See, that's why if you persist in sin, as we saw yesterday, Jesus intervenes, because all Christians are overcomers. And if, and if you won't respond, he'll keep tightening and tightening and tightening and finally take you home prematurely. But I will not let you, Jesus said, persist looking like a lost person when you're in my family. And I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. This means what? Well, to the Philadelphians. Remember the primary, the primary way of knowing what God was saying, the way to interpret it is, what did it mean to the original recipients? This was, Philadelphia was an earthquake prone. Think of L.A., Think of San Francisco, all those tremors they have out there. Philadelphia was like that. The city had been destroyed many times. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God to go out no more, what he's saying is, I'm going to make you firm and established and fixed. Because if you know anything about earthquakes, when it starts shaking, you go out of your house. You don't have to collapse on you. And they always were having to run out. You don't have to go out anymore, he said. 
Now look at this. I'll write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. You notice there's three lines to this address? Did you know I can take a piece of paper and I can put three lines on it, a name, you know, and a, and a city and a, and a state and a zip, and if I get those three lines on there, it separates one in 7.2 billion people. All you need is a little address, and you can get that, that letter to one person. Jesus said, you want to know how I'm going to get you safely to heaven? I'm going to write on you the name of, of my God and the name of the city of my God, and I'm going to write on a, my new name. And he says, you are safe and secure. And then that tag that's on every letter, he who has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Jesus gave the people of Philadelphia a very unique promise. He said, I'll make you pillars that will never fall down, never fail, never crack. You will forever be standing in the presence of God. Wow. Now, I did hear someone yesterday. They said to me, I'm afraid I'm going to be bored in heaven. Mm, that's a very, you know what, we do Q&As. That's one of my favorite things with college kids, and I've done them, hundreds of them. And that is a real normal common question. I said, well, let's just think about this. I said, do you like food? Uh, you know, I tell the college kids, do you like food? Oh, kids, college kids. I mean, they can eat and never get like the rest of us. And, oh, we love food. I said, who invented food? Can you imagine? I mean, people, the obsession of America now is food shows. Can you imagine having the person who invented food let you see and consume uh, stuff that, that is exquisitely delightful? Okay, let's talk about this. Who likes to travel? I mean, that's almost the desire of everybody. They want to have enough money to go see things. Well, how would you like the person that is the ultimate tour director that can take you to places you couldn't dream of, you know, and, and take you safely and securely and let you see things that makes you say, Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider. And can you imagine every day going to a different, indescribably beautiful place? Okay, how about sex? Anybody like sex? Boy, our world is obsessed with it. Who invented it? How about color? How about music and sound? Do you understand what I mean? Everything that is exciting or desirable to us, the one who initiated it said, I am going to give you something that I has not seen nor ear heard. It's not even entered into your minds. How incredible what I've prepared for you. But I've written it down and I've told you that you're going to get a front row seat at letting the God of the universe overwhelm you with wonder so that when you get back every day to the banquet after you've gone on your trip to the cluster of galaxies out there and just been wowed by God's power, that you're going to come back to the table and look at Christ and say, thanks, I can't believe you let me be here. And he'll say, well, wait till you see what we're doing next. You know what I mean? I mean, we have no concept of how, how much God wants us to see his glorious creative power. Jesus promised permanence, rest, security, forever. Wow. This is the most amazing letter of the seven. There are more promises in this letter. There are more blessings in this letter. There are more insights about Jesus Christ in this letter than in any of the others that he wrote. You know, everybody builds their life on something. Their career, their kids, their health, their successes, whatever, their money. You can build on a person, you can build on a philosophy, you can build on a religious system, a political system, you can build your life around your career, your plans, but you're going to build it on something. Everybody's got something they're winding around as they go through life. For the church at Philadelphia, they built their lives on the truths that are found in this letter. And Jesus said, bingo, you absolutely receive my approval Four truths of a forever changed life. Now, there aren't many truths that can change your life forever. You know? Uh, you can learn a new skill. It will change how you do stuff for a while as long as you remember the new skill, you know? My kids teach me, you know, some new Zippo thing on my computer or phone or iPad. What he does. 
he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one closes, closes and no one opens. See, he, he, it's totally different than all the other letters, and it's powerful. These are the four truths that Philadelphia built their church and their lives on, and they were never the same. Well, number one, verse seven of chapter three, he who is holy. Now, what's amazing about this is, this is the only attribute of God that gets the ultimate emphasis, right? We sing it. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, omnipotent, 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 or love, 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 or, you know, omniscient, omniscient, omniscient. You know, no. This is, if you want the ultimately emphasized attribute of God, bingo, there it is. Yet it's the least understood and almost least desired. I mean, people, when you think of holy, 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 you think of prune faces, Puritans, you know, people that, that don't have any fun, and, and that's just how the caricature, I mean, if you want to really, uh, you know, criticize someone, say that they're, they're goody, you know, goody two-shoes, you know, but God is ultimately holy. In the first five letters, Jesus kind of cuts and pastes the titles from chapter one. He, he just, in, in all the other churches, he just kind of goes back to chapter one and takes a couple of them and, you know, moves them around or something like that, not here. Here to Philadelphia, Jesus reaches all the way back in the Old Testament and imports the most powerful descriptions of an all-powerful, covenant-keeping God of heaven. And that's the first thing he does. He says, I am the holy God before whom Moses hid his face, before whom Isaiah said that, that he was uh, you know, totally undone, before whom when Job said, he says, I am, I'm crumbling, I'm melting away, before whom when John saw him in his holy resurrection power, he fell like dead before him. And Jesus introduces himself and he says, I want you to understand that I'm holy well, this is the only attribute of God that gets the ultimate emphasis. And I'll tell you, if you don't understand it, uh, it, it, just, it just changes everything once you understand that God wants us and everything connected to us and everything that we do and everything we allow in to be tainted by his holiness. Now, uh, Bonnie and I go every year, at least once a year, and, and do a, a course in Israel. We, we take people, and I do 100 lessons in Israel, and I take them around and show them the, the top 100 sites in the, the scriptures that are in Israel. And it's an amazing time, and I love it. And, and we've gone so much. I've, I've been going since the, the 80s. And uh, uh, every time I go, I always get tempted by Zatar. Zatar is hyssop. You know, hyssop, hyssop that, that you sprinkle the blood with and everything else. It's a little plant that grows over there and they grind it up and you dip your, your um, bagelinis, uh, these big uh, breads they make over there, you dip it in there, it's a powder and you eat it and it's wonderful and I feel like I'm in the Holy Land. So I always buy za'atar. So we were walking through the, the old city and the people were all amazed and looking at everything and I finished teaching them and I slipped in a shop like I always do and I bought some za'atar and it was just in one of those little things like you buy uh, you know, uh, potato salad in those little plastic round dishes. They have a little plastic, you know, lid that fits on it. And it had a nice little label that says, Biblical Zatar, you know. And so it cost a couple of shekels. And so I just stuck it in my backpack. But you know how life is. You know, we, we go over there all the time and we have our suitcase. In fact, we go so much, I have my Holy Land suitcase. And it has everything I use in the Holy Land. I keep it under the bed at home where we're only home 37 days a year. So I don't have time to repack. So I just keep it all in there. Well, I forgot to take out my za'atar. Because we rolled right from that trip to, you know, going to Korea. And so we left the suitcase under the bed and my little potato salad plastic top, biblical za'atar in there. And it came time for the, a whole year went by just like that. I mean, uh, we flew 100,000 miles between, but 100,000 miles later, I pull my suitcase out and then unzip it and open it up. Oh, my za'atar! And I picked it up like this and I, I saw the entire life cycle <laughs> of the moth 
laid eggs that turned to larvae that, that molted or made their cocoons into moths. So there was everything. There were dead worms, there were cocoons, and there were little, you know, frozen dead moths in my za'atar. It was unholy. <laughs> See, holy things don't have defilements and things that, that rot and mold and make worms and decay. Jesus said, I'm holy. This is the name that rings out from the throne room of the universe. It's the only name to get the ultimate emphasis. How does Jesus' holiness apply to me? Well, what did the person closest to him in his earthly ministry say? Peter said this, 1 Peter 1, 15, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. We're called by someone who is holy, someone who is uncorrupted, someone who is unfallen, someone who is unpolluted, and that calling begins to change everything in our lives. I'll never forget when... Uh, my children used to travel with us. We have eight children. They would be at all these sessions. And I can remember once I was doing a Word of Life thing and somewhere up in Maine, that Kittery place where all the outlets are. And, and Bonnie, for some reason, wasn't with me. And so I had four of the kids, and they were right there in the front row. And they were trying their hardest because if they sat like this, they could go to whatever that milkshake place is they have up there in New England. Uh, I don't remember the name of it. But, you know, if they were good, I was going to get them a... That's a real way to raise kids, give them milkshakes, but when mom's not there. But they were all good, and they were sitting there in the front. And so after they were all good, I got them all milkshakes, and we decided to walk by the outlets. And so I was, uh, two of them were big enough, they didn't need to be uh, holding their hands, but two of them were, I was holding their hands, and we were walking along like this, and all of a sudden my one son on this side wasn't coming. And I looked back, and, and, and he was looking down, and he was kind of like scuffing his feet. And I said, what is wrong with you? And, and he he was holding this hand, but he had this hand like this over his face, and he went, oh, we were going by the, I don't know the name of it, the women's underwear store, where they have like a 30-foot a wide picture of a woman wearing her underwear, and, and so he had decided he wasn't, you know, he wasn't going to look at that, so he was kind of, you know, trying to, to cover his eyes, and it was making him you know, hesitate coming, and I thought, wow, sitting on the front row, he heard me talk about holiness and not looking on nakedness, and he thought that woman was naked, and he wasn't going to look at her. Has holiness permeated every part of your life? You know, we'll sterilize the silverware and the plates and the cups so our kids get no, no you know, pathogen. But we'll let the deadliest, most debilitating pathogens, and we say, oh, I can watch that. There's only partial nudity. There's only a little bit of bloodshed. There's only a little bit of occultic stuff in it. Well, there was only probably one or two little eggs in my za'atar. You know, have you ever heard, read the little poem about the dog poo-poo and the brownies? You know, isn't that a gross one, you know? That, that they only put, you know, a half a teaspoon of dog poo-poo in the brownies and everyone started spitting them out? It, it isn't how much, it's the, even the presence. If you think it's awful to eat dog poo-poo in a brownie, what does the God of the universe think of us allowing into our lives what is unholy because he is holy, holy, holy. Do you understand? This is the only attribute that, that God emphasizes to this extent and we're called by someone who is holy, who is uncorrupted, who is unfallen, who is unpolluted and it's supposed to change our behavior, our intake, what we're comfortable around and what we become increasingly uncomfortable around. We don't want anything that displeases him. We don't want anything that in any way grieves him. That's where it starts. Number two, he who is true. Jesus' most emphasized attribute goes hand in hand with the second one. He is holy. He is true. He's the source of truth. He is truth itself. 
Jesus says, I am holy, I am just, I am righteous. Truth comes next. He who is holy cannot lie. He who is uncorrupted cannot fail. He who is holy is the only source of unblighted existence. So you know what? Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is the source of truth that leads to holiness. And yet, most people spend far more time listening to untruth, watching untruth, being entertained by untruth, being amused by untruth. In fact, what's the best seller in all Christian bookstores? All Christian bookstores. Fiction. Christian romance. Right? You know it. That's the number one selling Christian books. Fiction. God says, truth. But we want Christian, and I'm not, there's nothing wrong with Christian fiction. I mean, I read the Bodhi Taney series, the history of the Jews and the World War II and all, of, all, I mean, there's so many interesting things. But it pales compared to my intake of truth. Television is not a source of truth. Maybe it hits a truth now and then. Most music, especially secular music, is not a source of truth. Yet, 90% of every young person will know every lyric to the untruth lost pagan entertainers, whoever they idolize. I don't even know who the newest one is. I mean, uh, I, I couldn't even name a group, but they know. In fact, if you hear it playing, you see them singing it. They know it. It's almost unconscious. They know the words, but they don't know verses. I remember I, I went to one of the classes I was teaching. I says, how many of you right now on the spot, raise your hand if you could quote Galatians 2.20. I said, did none of you have a WANA or, you know, Word of Life clubs? Did you not have to memorize? One of them said, well, give us a little of it. I said, wow, I am crucified. One says, I, I think I know that. Out of a hundred. But if I would have started one of, um, oh, I wish I knew. What's the name of, come on, it's okay if you know. What's the name of a current <laughs> singer? I mean, like, I, I know Eminem, but I mean, he's a rapper. But I mean, like, wh no, not, wh who's the little blonde girl that's real, Taylor Swift, there we go. That's who I was trying to think of. If I started humming, a t in fact, I was at a Starbucks, and, and um, I asked the person, I said, what is that playing? They said, oh, and they started singing it to me, and it was a, a Taylor Swift. And unsaved and saved all know those words. But they don't know the words of him who is true. And you wonder why they're depressed and feel hopeless and meaningless and everything else. Okay. He who is holy cannot lie. The word true is aletheinos, which means genuine, the real thing, not counterfeit, like a piece of pure metal that stands the test. And Jesus says, I am the one. I will sanctify you by truth. I will lead you into truth. My truth converts your soul. In fact, we have the only truth that actually can go inside someone and change their non-material parts, their spirit, their emotions, their, the part of them that's immortal. You know, when I go to these conventions, I... Uh, with all these medical doctors, a whole bunch of them are, are, are into, you know, psychiatry and psychology because that's so big, you know, there's all this mental illness and everything else. And, and I say, I admire these, these doctors because the body, uh, you know, the head is also an organ. You know, you trust your heart doctor, trust your head doctor. There are organic problems that this organ has. And it needs to be stabilized, and there's a place for medication, and I'm not one of these that thinks that, that any medication is, you know, a compromise or whatever, or denial of God, Even, any more than an aspirin or a heart pill, if you have high blood pressure or high cholesterol, is a sin. But medicine can only stabilize, you know, lithium or whatever, it can only stabilize. Only truth can renew and transform. 
So there's, if, if someone needs stabilization, they should take their lithium. They want transformation. They want a new beginning. They want the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What's the soul? It's the non-material part of us. The law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, making that function. Boy, I went to school with a guy from inner city Philadelphia. He was a mainline skin-popping heroin addict before he got saved. Skin popping means you put the needle just under the skin and you put a bubble of heroin and it gives you an incredible high and it burns and leaves a horrible scar every time you do it on your arm or leg or wherever you're doing it, your stomach. This guy was pockmarked. He looked like the moon. He had been heroining for so long that he said he never could pass the Philadelphia uh, driver's ed thing, you know, the test. He said, they designed it so simply that, that some people took it with spray cans. You know, you could, you could answer the questions with, because there's so much graffiti over there, with a spray can. He had ruined his mind. And he came to school, and we were on the same hall, and his church said, hey, if you start memorizing scripture, the law of the Lord is perfect, it converts your soul, and it'll make wise the simple, and it will transform you. And you know what? He graduated from Bob Jones University, summa cum laude. He became a philologist. He became a Greek scholar. He became a Hebrew scholar. He's teaching in a, an Eastern European seminary now. He is an utter genius. He still looks like the moon. <laughs> but the Lord completely on the inside renewed him. Jesus speaks truth. Jesus, in this world, there's always falsehood, lies. Listen to Jesus. You want to hear an absolutely life-changing truth? God's truth can heal and renew our minds. In a world of uncertainty, Jesus introduces himself as the true one. He's the final word on everything, the ultimate authority. But thirdly, he holds the key. Uh, what's amazing is, and, and this is Shebna was a steward of the king, and he had the key of David, and what it was was access to the king. That's what you read about in chapter 22 of Isaiah. And that's what the key of David is. It's, it's a steward who would dispense the king's wealth. He is the one who would have access to the king's presence. He is the one that, remember the signet ring that would sign and put you know, the affirmation on things that it was a, a sealed document from the king. That's what the steward was. And Jesus says, that's who I am to God the Father. I open God's treasures. I open his presence. You want to come into the presence of the Most High? I'm the one who has made a new and living way. You want God's power? I dispense his power through my offering on the cross. The power of God through his spirit is yours. I am the one who has the key of David. I am the one that will give you access. I am the one that will give you the, the power to know that you have supernatural, life-changing, new beginning power you can dispense as a minister of reconciliation. That's another word for sharing the gospel. Jesus is holy. The people in Philadelphia decided if he was holy, they wanted to be as holy as it was possible on earth to be. Jesus is true. They wanted his truth. And they looked on his truth as more than their necessary food. Thy words were found and I did eat them, Jeremiah said, and thy word was to me the joy and rejoicing in my heart because I understand the truth. I'm called by your name, O Lord of hosts. Christians should be the most joyful, rejoicing people in the world because they know the truth, because they know the one with the key. He's opened the presence, the treasures, the power of God. Here's the last one. It says in verse 7 at the end, he who opens and no one closes, he who shuts and no one can open. In other words, this whole idea that Jesus has this ultimate power. When Jesus does something, that's it. Uh, there, there, well, let me just go through these. In John 4, 14, in fact, if you want to, I'm going to end here. Let's go to John 4, and I want to just show you Jesus applying this, starting in John 4, 14. Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. You notice that? You go to chapter 6, verse 35, he says, if you eat of me, you'll never hunger. John 8, 12, he says, if you walk in my light, you'll never walk in darkness. You notice the never, never, nevers? The first two never shut doors Jesus opens are the door to eternal satisfaction and the door to eternal light. Jesus said, I will endlessly satisfy you. Your job never will. Your partner never will completely. Your kids never will. The world never will. But I will give you endless satisfaction. 
and I will give you endless light. You will walk in the light. Uh, in fact, you know what Proverbs 4 says? The path of the righteous is like the rising sun. It just gets brighter and brighter and brighter. What a way to live. The last door that Jesus says never about is the door to endless life. John 8, 51. Uh, Jesus, and I'll read it, in his uh, conflict with the religious leaders, he says this, Most assuredly I say unto you that anyone that keeps my word shall never see death. Wow. Whoever lives and believes in me, Jesus said, will never die. That means death isn't, we're never going to die. We're going to transition. My body's going to die and it's awful, it's painful, it's kind of frightening, it's kind of scary. I've always been in this body, I don't know how to make it without it. But Jesus told me if I just hold his hand, just before death comes, he's going to meet me and he's going to personally walk me through the valley of the shadow of death so death never hits me. The cold, cruel, dark, fearsome death will never hit me. I was standing with my father, remember the punching, choking dad that I had. Boy, he was the most radiant Christian when God got a hold of his heart, transformed him. What a miracle of the gospel. I was holding his hand. He was 92 years old. He was strong as an ox to the end, but his heart gave out. And we were, he had all those things, those tubes and the respirator and the mask and everything. And we were singing and he was fogging up his mask singing. And he had the biggest hands, the ones that used to choke me and punch my mom, were the most soft, big, like bear claws. And he was holding my hand singing and puffing away in his respirator and all of a sudden I saw his eyes go and he went just like that and he let go of my hand and he just it's just like the air went out of the air mattress and you know what happened he saw the one who said it's appointed unto man once to die and I'm going to walk you through the valley and I've made an appointment with you and I'm going to walk you he saw Jesus and he let go of my hand to take his. The doorway, Jesus, is the door to endless life. Well, we need to live the forever changed life. We need to share that gospel. Uh, Bonnie and I just finished up at a conference uh, near Chicago. It was all big time. Doctors, lawyers, real estate developers, wealthy, mega, people that have you know six zeros after their name, not just one or two or three. I mean, just big... And there was one of these, an executive of one of these big oil companies. Boy, he just, in the service, he just watched me. He was in his 80s. He would watch me like this as I paced around. At the meal line, I always noticed he was trailing me. And he, he never really said anything. He just followed me around. Finally, at the end of the conference, he comes walking up to me. He just wanted to talk. And I said, yeah, yeah. I saw his name. I said, hi, Jerry. He said, your messages have been hitting me. I said, is that positive or negative? You know, I didn't know how to respond. Is it bothering you or were you happy? He's, and he just kept going like this. And finally, I thought, well, wait a minute. Not everybody that comes to these conferences know the Lord. I said, hitting you, eh? I said, let me just ask you one quick question. I said, you were a 30-year, 40-year executive. Yeah, yeah, vice president of a big oil company. I said, yeah. I said, where are all your sins right now? 80-some-year-old man, tears starting right down his face. He said, everything you talked about, the endless life, he said, this overflowing rivers of living water. He says, he says, I've been an elder in the Presbyterian church since I was 21 years old. He says, I have given away so much money. He says, and he started, it was like a confessional. He says, my wife left me, I didn't leave her. And he says, and I, I married the one I took up with. He was just trying to, you know, tell me that he wasn't as bad as he really was. And I says, hey, this is not a confessional. I says, where are your sins right now? And he says, oh, he says, you talked in all these sessions about Jesus coming and taking all of it. I said, what would keep you right now from calling on the name of the Lord? The most radiant transformation. And I gave him his track, and, and he said, that's what I want. And this is what we're supposed to be doing, living and talking about the forever changed life. He is holy, he is true, he is the one that has the access to God and opens it for us, and what he opens can never shut, and what he shut will never be opened. He will redeem us. Jesus is not looking to find absolute perfection. That's not the ultimate Christian life. It's just faithfulness. 
It's just confessing and forsaking sin. It's just getting into word every day and saying, Lord, speak to me. I want to hear your voice. And I don't want to just hear it. I want to let your word within me become the joy and rejoicing in my heart. Now, you're at Word of Life, and I'm five minutes late, but they have to forgive me because I'm not going to be here tomorrow. Um, I mean, Lord willing, I hope I'm here at the board meeting. But let me ask you this. How do you cultivate faithfulness? You should at this conference make a decision that some sector of your life you're going to work on for the next year and ask someone to see if they see you growing in that area. Now, let, I'll give you four suggestions. Number one, have you ever thought about a tune-up of your marriage and family? Did you know that's the most powerful display of Christ, where you as a husband are playing the part of Christ, your wife is playing the part of the church, and you are to radiate life in such a way that people come up to you and say, are you guys newlyweds? What's going on? I mean, people ask me, did you just marry her? I said, no, no, I wish I, you know, I, wish I married her earlier. Have you tuned up your marriage and family for it to be the way God's word describes it to be? Do you know what the word says is to be the way that we operate as a family? How about your disciplines? Have you got those down? Have you got down discipline yourself for godliness, the, the idea of memorizing and meditating? How about the discipline of time? Anything that's out of control is not under God's control. How about the, the discipline of solitude, having quietness in your life? How about meditation? It's the only thing that Jesus said that can make us prosperous and successful. Most people don't even know the disciplines, like fasting. When's the last time you heard a a, a real challenge on that. And how about our emotions? Do you know who the most written about person in the Bible is? Uh, it took me a whole year I spent with David. There are 141 chapters in the Bible about David. David had every emotional problem, every physical, every relational problem. I mean, he had kids killing each other, raping each other. I mean, he's chased out of town by his boss, loses his job, thinks God deserted him. He had basically what we'd call a complete emotional breakdown. He was spitting out his mouth and letting it run down his beard and dribble onto his clothes while he was scraping his fingernails. You know what? David was a man after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, just because he was faithful. Some of us need to have a little emotional tune-up. And, and finally, uh, this is my dissertation that's in the back. This is how to understand prophecy. Prophecy is not to argue about, it's to see Jesus Christ. And the more we see him, people come to us and say, I don't know anything about you, but you seem to be calmer, more peaceful. Uh, you seem to be on something. What is it you're on? And we can share Christ with them. Jesus just wants us to be faithful. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for word of life, 77 years of holding forth the word of life, reaching each generation to reach their generation, which is what we're called all of us to do. I pray that we'd realize we can have that life that has your absolute approval, and we would surrender more of ourselves to you today, that you can live through us, you who are holy, you who are true, you who have the key of David, and you who open and no one can shut, and you who shut and no one can open. We thank you in the precious name of Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. amen.